Hello and welcome to topic one, transporting cells. A quick look at the first bit of spec. <clears throat> so really, we, it's all about diffusion and knowing about um, what diffusion is and why it's important. So let's let's look at it. And it's, the bullet points are always worth paying attention to. You know, concentration difference, temperature or surface area of, of membrane. So let's just start off with just diffusion into and out of a, a respiring cell. So here's a cell. Let's pop it out. I've just failed my, my drawing skill for having a broken cross line there, but never mind. I'm sure yours will be better if, you, if you're filling in. So yeah, oxygen diffuses into the cell, as does glucose. Yeah, for you know aerobic respiration. Um, and when we say diffuse, they don't just um, diffusion isn't just movement; it is moving from low to high concentration. Okay, so diffusion only takes place until concentrations are equal. Um, at when concentrations are equal, the particles still move, but they balance. They have an equal chance of moving in and out. So yeah, oxygen diffuses in, glucose diffuses in, and then out diffuses CO2, um, and it's going to make water. Because you know, I'm basically giving you the equation for aerobic respiration. In terms of making this go faster, well, you know, we're a warm-blooded animal, so we're at 37 degrees C. Therefore, there's there's an increase in kinetic energy. Yeah, this faster movement, therefore, there's more chance of oxygen hitting the cell, yeah, and bumping into it, and therefore going through it. Um, concentration gradient is just the difference between the outside and the inside. Okay, so if if I increase the oxygen concentration, or if I eat a, you know a chocolate bar and an energy bar or something, and I have more glucose in my blood, it's going to diffuse into the cell faster. Yeah, so concentration gradient is just, um, yeah, the same as concentration difference. Um, and, yeah, glucose diffuses down the concentration gradient. Oxygen diffuses down the concentration gradient. Diffusion is always down a concentration gradient. Down a conch gradient. Never a long. A long doesn't imply down. And yeah, the the higher the concentration difference, the steeper that gradient is, and therefore the faster it goes in. And the other one was surface area. If this cell was like wobbly, instead of like just circular in in two D, I've increased the surface area, so it's got a um, you know, it's got a higher surface area, therefore more collision chance. Ooh. Collision chance. Yeah, the particle has to hit. The cell membrane to get into the cell the bigger the cell membrane the higher the chance um there i was talking about like surface area but surface area to volume ratios also important i made a little cube here this is this is one by one by one um, this cube over here is three by three by three so imagine that um you know well this this one cube has got an area um, a surface area of six times one centimeter squared. So one one face is one centimeter squared, or one squared. Let, let's assume it's a centimeter, um, and therefore it's got six faces because it's a cube. So yeah, it's got a surface area of six, and it's got a volume of one centimeter cubed. Okay, so it's got a six to one ratio. It's got a very high surface area compared to its volume. Whereas this one over here um, is three by three by three. So three times three is nine, um, and then times by six is 54. So it's got a surface area of 54 centimeters squared, and it's nine cubed, nine to the power, sorry, three cubed, sorry, three to the power three is, oh yeah, good old 27. Um, I don't like, I can't compare these because I'm not smart enough, so I need to get them both to one. So I divide both sides by 27, of my ratio, my 27 equals, oh, yeah, it's two to one. Okay, so this is got a, a way, 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 you know, a, a three times smaller surface area to volume ratio. Okay, and if you imagine that this is a cell, and this is therefore also made of made of cells of the same size, there'd be like one square in the middle that is not next to any surface. Yeah, it's surrounded and therefore 
that cell's gonna you know be insulated and things and it might get too warm so you know this is the reason why we need exchange systems the bigger an organism gets the more there are cells that are not near a surface if you're very small you can get everything you need by diffusion like this one cell here it's very small and therefore um if there's oxygen and glucose surrounding it it can get everything it needs by it but if you go to an organism that's made of many cells then it's um it needs a transport system to increase the surface area somewhere because um, it's got a small surface area to volume ratio so a mouse has got a high surface area to volume ratio an elephant has got a low surface area to volume ratio now obviously the elephant has a bigger surface area but yeah it's it's in relation to its volume is what you need to talk about so yeah small things have got a high surface area to volume ratio and larger things have got a smaller surface area to volume ratio i can arrange these if i've got um you know if there's 27 cells that make up this shape over here if i if i lay, arrange them like a worm would be just in a line then i'm going to increase the surface area compared to this shape the worst shape to be for a high surface area to volume ratio is a sphere so yeah a large spherical organism you know like a um, like a seal you know they're like very rounded they have a very low surface area to volume ratio which is really good because it's good for streamline through water and it's good for not losing heat from so some things want a small surface area to volume ratio um however you know elephants are, are a large like rounded animal aren't they but yeah they've got massive ears to have a so that they can lose heat so again it's just responding to what they tell you um often it, it fits in with topic seven so paper two where it's like adaptations um surface area often comes into that as well so let's look, let's look at the exchange materials it says in the syllabus that we need to know about how the small intestine is good at is an effective at um as an exchange surface so you need a large surface area so how does a small intestine give a large surface area so if i if i cut through the small intestine it's a tube but yeah the inside of the tube is wobbly yeah so it has these like fingers called villi yeah one's one's called a villus so i better point to two and then, and then it's correct yeah so yeah so yes yeah, so it's a folded lining therefore more places for absorption of nutrients um, absorption okay so yeah you know that's what i that's what i want to focus on there you know it does squeeze food along so it helps to maintain the concentration gradient but let's just think of surface area on this one the lungs i'm not going to draw them all but you know it we, we have a trachea and then it branches into the bronchi and then they branch and they branch and they branch and they branch and they branch so into the bronchial so we have a trachea trachea on the syllabus bronchi on the syllabus again this is this is topic two these are bronchioles not on the syllabus but should be in my opinion um but yeah they terminate in alveoli so there's alveoli at the end alveoli so they have a high surface area because there are millions of them millions of alveoli um plus each one has many capillaries squeeze it in so yeah so there's do, just don't talk about you know the lungs are good at exchange because because an alveolus has a high surface area one alveolus hasn't got a high surface area it's it's a it's like a sphere um but yeah because we have millions of them because we have a branching bronchial tree that means that we the lungs have a high surface area so yeah an alveolus hasn't got a high surface area the lungs do because of the millions of alveoli and then each alveolus is um is covered in loads of capillaries it's also this is where you can bring in your one cell thick if i if i, if I drew a an alveolus the cells look like this so there's my alveolus um again it's so it's so it's one cell thick so there's there's air in there and um therefore to get into the blood that's next to it it only has to travel through like one 
and it's a really thin cell as well. So you can talk about that. Um, gills of fish. Again, it's you don't learn them in detail, but the, it's kind of similar that they need to um, increase the surface area. So a gill of a fish is like a, a structure like that, and then it's kind of it's got structures going across, and then it's got structures on there as well. So again, it's it's like it's branchy. Yeah. So yeah. So it's, so it it kind of looks like that, or feathery. It looks like. So yeah. So uh, it's got. Um, yeah, um, yeah, so lots of branches, therefore a high surface area. So it's also got lots of capillaries. Um, in direct contact with water as well, in direct contact with water so that you can get the oxygen really, really easily. Again, they tend to give you a picture of a gill and label it and ask you about how it's designed for a high surface area or high high exchange and then leaves um again there's a whole topic on leaves um and i think I did, i've done a video on leaves i think in the in the first one was like plant transport and structure and stuff so yeah j just to kind of quickly show a leaf there's like the upper epidermis and these are the palisade cells then we get to the spongy mesophyll then i get to the lower epidermis and i get to the stomata so that's a, a small part of a leaf cell and therefore, yeah, how's it got a high, well, it's a flat structure, a large flat structure is a leaf, so it's got a high surface area. But yeah, it, it has millions of al mill alveoli, millions of stomata, or thousands, it depends on the size of the leaf, hundreds of thousands for like a thumb sized leaf. But yeah, I would focus as well on, on the air spaces um, in the spongy mesophyll. So they're highly likely to not ask this question on its own. It, it'll be in a in a leaf question, yeah. The lung one will be in a lung question. The small intestine will be in a digestion question. Fish gills is a standalone thing, yeah. We we don't know any more detail about it. So if the, they could easily yeah build a larger question. So yes, yeah. Air space is in the spongy mesophyll, therefore fast diffusion of gases. say gases that's the fusion of they want co2 for photosynthesis yeah so it's easy for the gases to get in because there's loads of stomata and it's easy to get to the palisade cells because there's loads of, st of stomata and it's got a nice easy air passage to kind of get there super let's have a look back to the syllabus um so yeah i've kind of gone through a lot there about surface area um, a membrane that is thin uh, just be careful on membrane all uh, it's not saying cell membrane all cell membranes are the same thickness on every cell um so a, a membrane can be a cell membrane or it can be a sheet of cells so we're really talking about a sheet of cells is thin um yeah efficient blood supply so i've talked about yeah lots of blood in the alveoli lots of blood in the in the um capillaries sorry there's lots of capillaries in the fish gills I could even talk about that in the villi there, they're full of blood vessels as well. Um, what, I, what I didn't go for is ventilated. That, yeah, that when we breathe, um, we keep the air inside the alveoli with high oxygen. So I've got a concentration gradient. The fish are kind of like moving through the water or they're making water move over their gills. So they maintain the concentration gradient as well. So yeah, so there's a, there's a flow of water going over the gills. Um, it's also in, in, in a certain direction that also keeps the concentration gradient high because it's opposite to the blood flow. But again, that's really getting into A-level detail. Again, the aim of this isn't to teach everything perfectly. It's to kind of yeah, set out you know, things that you might want to kind of like add a bit more to. Otherwise, it'll take forever. Um, next is osmosis active transport. Um, I put the the um, definition here, just learn it, there's three marks for this definition. You know, if the question is ever about water, it's either transpiration in plants, which isn't osmosis, or it's osmosis. Yeah, so if, if it's ever water moving through a cell, or between a cell on the outside, because a cell membrane is partially permeable, it's osmosis. And people forget about this solution word, 
yeah, it goes it goes to a more concentrated solution, or it goes from a dilute solution to a more concentrated solution. So uh, there's a required practical here as well that you need to know about um, plant tissue. So yeah, this is a piece of potato, potato, um, and this is a solution. So probably a salt solution because it's less, but it could be a sugar solution. Um, and you would, you know, we, we set up lots of these at different concentrations and we re, we record data to kind of get a graph that looks like this with it. That, that's the salt conch on the X axis. Um, and that's normally something called molar, a concentration unit. Um, and then this is the percentage change in mass or length. So that's zero. These are going to gain mass or length up, up here. And these are going to lose mass. So when I have zero salt concentration, as in pure water, well, water diffusion is the, the diffusion of water to a more concentrated solution. Well, um, if it's zero outside, the potato must be more concentrated than zero. Therefore, yeah, it's going to gain mass. So I'm going to have a point here. I get a point there. There's a certain one where it starts to lose mass and lose mass more. It can't lose mass forever or can't get smaller forever. Um, well, you know, it, it can't get smaller forever because the cell walls will stop it getting any smaller. I'll pop on my line of best fit. There it goes. And they're always interested in this point here because that's the point where there was no change in mass or length. And therefore, that's the point that's the same concentration. That's That would be a concentration where the potato where osmosis doesn't take place because there's not a difference in concentration so that's where i where i can get the um the um yeah like the concentration of um potato cytoplasm or potato cells and because it's relying on um diffusion you would have to control temperature so control variables so cvs in this experiment Maybe temperature, so you probably have it in a water bath. Um, time, how long you leave it, so you leave it for like for twenty minutes in the salt solution. Um, and you'd also need to, if I'm weighing it, it'd have to be like dry when I weigh it, or dry to the same extent each time. Um, so yeah, so we're varying the salt concentration. That's our independent variable. We're measuring mass or length of potato. That's our dependent variable, and I keep everything else the same. Um, a note on my graph, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six points. Yeah, five minimum. If, you, if you're designing an experiment and you need a, a range of things to test, you go for five minimum. So, yeah, so that's osmosis. And then quickly, active transport, because it's quite a long one, this, sorry for going on for so long. Um, yeah, so this is moving substances from low to high concentration, or up the concentration gradient and we have to use energy from respiration it's really important that we don't just say using energy because osmosis and diffusion both require kinetic energy yeah so it's extra energy from respiration you can get around you can say using atp which is the energy currency that's made in respiration or yeah it's um, but it's not on the syllabus but it appears on mark schemes so I thought we'd, again, you know, active transport can apply to lots of things, but it says kidney and plant roots. Um, so let's just quickly go through the active transport in the kidney. Um, so remember, we, we, we have this like filtration cup. And this tube is going to end up eventually going to the bladder. So this is, this is one of the many filters in the kidney. There's millions of these. This is blood coming in. There's blood, it kind of spins round, and then the, the blood vessels kind of snake back round this yeah, to do reabsorption. And as you know, small things get kind of like forced out of the blood. And one of those is glucose, and I don't want to lose glucose. So if I just zoom into a bit of this tubule here, let's just um, look here. So I've got my my line and the, it's basically lined with cells that look like this so there's there's 
another cell and another cell so they have like little folds um and then this is going to be where my my uh, my blood's going to be here so that this is going to be my my capillaries again really thin thin cells so yeah so so these are my red blood cells that are that are in the blood um and here this is glucose it's been filtered out because it's small but i don't well, i don't want to lose it okay so therefore we i've got glucose in the filtrate here so this is where the, the blue dots are in the in here i'm going to move it into the blood yeah so i want to move all of it therefore it moves back to transport so inside these cells they have lots and lots of mitochondria so these are mitochondria yeah to to make atp or to make to release energy so yeah so they make atp for active transport of all the glucose into the blood okay this is this is all moving down here um so you've only got a certain amount of time so you can think you know if you're diabetic and you can't get rid of glucose in your blood because you can't make insulin then you can see why some glucose is going to get to the bladder. Hence, they test for diabetes by the presence of glucose in the urine. Okay, but yes, yeah, so that's an that's an example. But crucially, this mitochondria present, and it's exactly the same for the, for the plant root. In the the roots, so there's a root. Off of the roots of these hairs, and if we show one of these hairs over here. Um, it's just a it's just a specialized plant cell you probably did it in key stage three they look like that so this is this is the soil out here um and you know it's got a vacuole and things it's got a nucleus but crucially it's got loads and loads of mitochondria so these are mitochondria mitochondria and in the soil is um ions that it needs so we need to know magnesium ions and there's one called a nitrate ion as well. You don't need to know Mg2 plus and NO3 minus, but yeah, NO3 plus is a is a nitrate ion, and that's a magnesium. I'm not going to write magnesium, and there's not a lot of it, and there's um, and therefore the, if we're going to move into here, then it moves in back to transport, so it can like grab all of the nitrates and all of the magnesium from the soil, so it can make chlorophyll. Can make amino acids and therefore proteins um and you know quick quickly while 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 i've got it water also moves in why does water move in well it's moving into a cell it moves by osmosis so you can again you can easily imagine where when magnesium moves into the cell by active transport it makes the solution here more concentrated it's a more concentrated solution and therefore water will move in from the soil into the more concentrated solution through a partially permeable membrane that's just behind the cell wall and then that moves in by osmosis and then it can just pass all of this to the next cell and the next cell and the next cell and eventually it gets to the xylem where it then shoots up um, to the leaves where it's used to make chlorophyll amino acids or the water's used to replace what's lost in transpiration so I've said loads there but again you, you can do a lot of revision transport just by looking at the lungs digestion the kidney etc i've done almost 25 minutes there so it's a lot longer than i plan to do i do apologize but again you can stop the video can't you and play the other half as and when okay hopefully something was useful there